Amanda Marie Knox was born on July 9, 1987. Knox grew up in Seattle, Washington, with three younger sisters. Her German-born mother, Edda Mell is a mathematics teacher, and her father, Kurt Knox a vice president of finance at the local Macy's, divorced when Amanda was a few years old. Her stepfather, Chris Mellers, is an information technology consultant. Knox first traveled to Italy on a family holiday at the age of 15. During that first trip to Italy, she visited Rome, Pisa, the Amalfi Coast, and the ruins of Pompeii. Upon reading Under the Tuscan Sun, which was given to her by her mother, Amanda's interest in the country increased. Knox graduated from the Seattle Preparatory School in 2005 and then studied linguistics at the University of Washington. In 2007, she made the dean's list at the university. She worked at part-time jobs to fund an academic year in Italy. Relatives described the 20-year-old Knox as outgoing but unwary. Her stepfather had strong reservations about her going to Italy that year, as he felt she was still too naive. In Perugia, Knox lived in a four-bedroom, ground-floor apartment in a house at Via della Pergola 7 with three other women. Her flatmates were Meredith Kircher, a British exchange student, and two Italian trainee lawyers in their late twenties. Kircher and Knox moved in on September 10 and 20 in 2007 respectively, meeting each other for the first time. Knox was employed part-time at a bar called Le Chic, which was owned by a Congolese man, Dr. Patrick Lumumba. She told flatmates that she was going to quit because he was not paying her, Lumumba denied this. Kircher's English female friend saw relatively little of Knox, who preferred to mix with Italians. The walkout semi-basement apartment of the house was rented by young Italian men with whom both Kircher and Knox were friendly. One of the men Giacomo Salenzi, spent time in the girls' flat due to a shared interest in music. Returning home at 2 a.m. one night in mid-October, Knox, Kircher, Salenzi, and another basement resident met a basketball court acquaintance of the Italians, Rudy Guade. Guade attached himself to the group and asked about Knox. He was invited into the basement by the Italians. Knox and then Kircher came down to join them. At 4.30 a.m. Kircher left, saying she was going to bed, and Knox followed her out. Guade spent the rest of the night in the basement. Knox recalled a second night out with Kircher and Salenzi in which Guade joined them and was allowed into the basement. He was never invited into the women's apartment. Three weeks before her death, Kircher went with Knox to the Eurococolate Festival. On October 20, Kircher became romantically involved with Salenzi, after going to a nightclub with him as part of a small group that included Knox. Guade visited the basement later that day. On October 25, Kircher and Knox went to a concert, where Knox met Raffaele Solicito, a 23-year-old software engineer student. She began spending her time at his flat, a five-minute walk from Via della Pergola 7. November 1 was a public holiday, and the Italians living in the house were away. It is believed that after watching a movie at some friend's house, Kircher returned home around 9 p.m. that evening and was alone in the house. Just after midday on November 2, Knox called Kircher's English phone. But though Kircher kept the phone in her jeans and could always be reached on it, the call was not answered. Knox then called Filomena Romanelli, one of the two Italian trainee lawyers she and Kircher shared the apartment with, and in a mixture of Italian and English said she was worried something had happened to Kircher, as on going to Via della Pergola 7 apartment earlier that morning Knox had noticed an open front door, bloodstains, including a footprint, in the bathroom, and Kircher's bedroom door locked. Knox and Solicito then went to Via della Pergola 7, and on getting no answer from Kircher unsuccessfully tried to break in the bedroom door, leaving it noticeably damaged. At 12.47 p.m., Knox called her mother and was told to contact the police as an emergency. Solicito called the Carabinieri, one of Italy's national police forces, getting through at 12.51 p.m. He was recorded telling him there had been a break-in with nothing taken, and the emergency was that Kirch's door was locked, she was not answering calls to her phone, and there were bloodstains. Police telecommunications investigators arrived to inquire about an abandoned phone, which was in fact Kirch's Italian unit. Romanelli arrived and took over, explaining the situation to the police who were informed about Kircher's English phone, which had been handed in as a result of its ringing when Knox called it. 
On discovering Kirch's English phone had been found dumped, Romanelli demanded that the policemen force Kirch's bedroom door open, but they did not think the circumstances warranted damaging private property. The door was then kicked in by a friend of Romanelli, and Kirch's body was discovered on the floor. She had been stabbed and died from exsanguination due to neck wounds. Pathologist Luca Lally, from Perugia's Forensic Science Institute, performed the autopsy on Kirch's body. Her injuries consisted of 16 bruises and 7 cuts. These included several bruises and a couple of insubstantial cuts on the palm of her hand. Bruises on her nose, nostrils, mouth, and underneath her jaw were compatible with a hand being clamped over her mouth and nose. Lally's autopsy report was reviewed by three pathologists from Perugia's Forensic Science Institute who interpreted the injuries, including some to the genital region, as indicating an attempt to immobilize Kircher during sexual violence. A funeral was held on 14 December 2007 at Croydon Parish Church, with more than 300 people in attendance, followed by a private burial at Croydon's Mitcham Road Cemetery. The degree that Kircher would have received in 2009 was awarded posthumously by the University of Leeds. The first detectives on the scene were Monica Napoleoni and her superior Marco Chiacchiera. Napoleoni conducted the initial interviews and quizzed Knox about her failure to immediately raise the alarm, which was later widely seen as an anomalous feature of Knox's behavior. According to Knox, Napoleoni was hostile to her from the outset. Chiaquiera discounted the signs of a break-in, deeming them clearly fake by the killer. The police were not told the extent of Kirch's relationship with Salenzi in initial interviews. On November 4, the same day Chiaquiera was quoted as saying that someone known to Kircher and let into the house by her might be responsible for her murder, Guade is believed to have left Perugia. Over the following days Knox was repeatedly interviewed, ostensibly as someone who might become a witness. She told police that on November 1st she received a text from Lumumba advising that her evening waitressing shift had been cancelled and she had stayed over at Solicito's apartment, only going back to the house she shared with Kircher on the morning the body was discovered. Knox was not provided with legal counsel, as Italian law only mandates the appointment of a lawyer for someone suspected of a crime. On the night of November 5th, Knox voluntarily went to the police station, although what followed is a matter of dispute. Police arrested Knox, Solicito, and Patrick Lumumba on November 6, 2007. Charges against Lumumba were dropped a short time later. At her trial, Knox testified that she had spent hours maintaining her original story, that she had been with Solicito at his flat all night and had no knowledge of the murder, but a group of police would not believe her. Knox said, I wasn't just stressed and pressurized, I was manipulated. She testified to being told by the interpreter, probably I didn't remember well because I was traumatized, so I should try to remember something else. Knox stated, they said they were convinced that I was protecting someone. Knox also said that a policewoman was pressuring her to try remember and then hit her. Knox alleged the policewoman hit her a second time again telling Knox to remember. Knox said she had requested a lawyer but was told it would make things worse for her, and that she would go to jail for 30 years, she also said she was not allowed access to food, water, or the bathroom. Fakara and policewoman Lorena Zugarini testified that during the interview Knox was given access to food, water, hot drinks, and the lavatory. They further said Knox was asked about a lawyer but did not have one. They went on to say Knox was not hit at any time, and interviewed firmly but politely. Under pressure, Knox falsely stated that she had been in the house when Kircher was killed, and that she thought the murderer was Lumumba who Knox knew had been serving customers at his bar all that night. Knox, Solicito, and Lumumba were taken into custody and charged with the murder. Her first meeting with her legal counsel was on November 11th. Chiaquiera, who thought the arrests were premature, dropped out of the investigation soon afterward, leaving Napoleone in charge of a major investigation for the first time in her career. Customers who Lumumba had been serving at his bar on the night of the murder gave him a complete alibi. After his bloodstained fingerprints were found on bedding under Kirch's body, Guade who had fled to Germany was extradited back to Italy. Guade, Knox, and Solicito were then charged with committing the murder together. On November 30, a panel of three judges endorsed the charges, 
and ordered Knox and Solicito held in detention pending a trial. In a formal interview with Mignini, Knox said she had been brainwashed by police interrogators into accusing Lumumba and implicating herself. Knox became the subject of unprecedented pre-trial media coverage drawing on unattributed leaks from the prosecution, including a best-selling Italian book whose author imagined or invented incidents that were purported to have occurred in Knox's private life. Guade fled to Germany shortly after the murder. During a November 19, 2007 Skype conversation with his friend Giacomo Benedetti, Guade did not mention Knox or Solicito as being in the house on the night of the murder. Later his account changed and he indirectly implicated them in the murder, which he denied involvement in. Guade was arrested in Germany on November 20, then extradited to Italy on December 6. Guade opted to be tried in a special fast-track procedure by Judge Michaeli. He was not charged with having had a knife. He did not testify and was not questioned about his statements, which had altered from his original version. Guade was convicted of murder, but the official judge's report on the conviction specified that he had not had a knife or stabbed the victim, or stolen any of Kirch's possessions. Michaelis' finding that Guade must have had an accomplice gave support to the later prosecution of Knox. In October 2008, Guade was found guilty of the sexual assault and murder of Kircher and sentenced to 30 years imprisonment. His prison sentence was ultimately reduced to 16 years. He was later given an early release in December 2020 and authorized to finish his sentence with community service. Amanda Knox was dissatisfied with his early release and spoke publicly against it. In 2009, Knox and Solicito pleaded not guilty at a court d'assise on charges of murder, sexual assault, carrying a knife, simulating a burglary, and theft of 300 euros, two credit cards, and two mobile phones. According to the prosecution, Knox's first call of November 2nd, to Kirch's English phone, was to ascertain if Kirch's phones had been found, and Solicito had tried to break in the bedroom door because after he and Knox locked it behind them, they realized they had left something that might incriminate them. Knox's call to her mother in Seattle, a quarter of an hour before the discovery of the body, was said by prosecutors to show Knox was acting as if something serious might have happened before the point in time when an innocent person would have such concern. A prosecution witness, homeless man Antonio Curatolo, said Knox and Solicito were in a nearby square on the night of the murder. Prosecutors advanced a single piece of forensic evidence linking Solicito to Kirch's bedroom, where the murder had taken place, fragments of his DNA on Kirch's bra clasp. Julia Bongiorno, leading Solicito's defense, questioned how Solicito's DNA could have gotten on the small metal clasp of the bra, but not on the fabric of the bra back strap from which it was torn. The back strap of the bra had multiple traces of DNA belonging to Guade. According to the prosecution's reconstruction, Knox had attacked Kircher in her bedroom, repeatedly banged her head against a wall, forcefully held her face, and tried to strangle her. They then said that Guade, Knox and Solicito had removed Kircher's jeans, and held her on her hands and knees while Guade had sexually abused her. Then that Knox had cut Kircher with a knife before inflicting the fatal stab wound, then faked a burglary. The judge pointedly questioned Knox about a number of details, especially concerning her phone calls to her mother and Romanelli. The defense suggested that Guade was a lone killer who had murdered Kircher after breaking in. Knox's lawyers pointed out that no shoe prints, clothing fibers, hairs, fingerprints, skin cells, or DNA of Knox's were found on Kircher's body, clothes, handbag, or anywhere else in Kircher's bedroom. The prosecution alleged that all forensic traces in the room that would have incriminated Knox had been wiped away by her and Solicito. Knox's lawyers said it would have been impossible to selectively remove her traces, and emphasized that Guade's shoe prints, fingerprints, and DNA were found in Kircher's bedroom. Guade's DNA was on the strap of Kircher's bra, which had been torn off, and his DNA was found on a vaginal swab taken from her body. Guade's bloody palm print was on a pillow that had been placed under Kircher's hips. Guade's DNA, mixed with Kircher's, was on the left sleeve of her bloody sweatshirt and in bloodstains inside her shoulder bag, from which 300 euros and credit cards had been stolen. 
Both sets of defense lawyers requested the judges to order independent reviews of evidence including DNA and the compatibility of the wounds with the alleged murder weapon. The request was denied. In final pleas to the court, Solicito's lawyer described Knox as a weak and fragile girl who had been duped by the police. Knox's lawyer pointed to text messages between Knox and Kircher as showing that they had been friends. On December 5, 2009, Knox, by then 22, was convicted on charges of faking a break-in, defamation, sexual violence, and murder, and was sentenced to 26 years imprisonment. Solicito was sentenced to 25 years. In Italy, opinion was not generally favorable toward Knox, and an Italian jurist remarked, this is the simplest and fairest criminal trial one could possibly think of in terms of evidence. In the United States, the verdict was widely viewed as a miscarriage of justice. American lawyers expressed concern about pre-trial publicity, and statements excluded from the murder case being allowed for a contemporaneous civil suit heard by the same jury. Knox's defense attorneys were seen as by American standards, passive in the face of the prosecution's use of character assassination. A number of U.S. experts spoke out against DNA evidence used by the prosecution. According to consultant Gregory Hampikian, the Italian forensic police could not replicate the key result, claimed to have successfully identified DNA at levels below those an American laboratory would attempt to analyze, and never supplied validation of their methods. Knox was indicted in 2010 on charges of defamation against the police for saying she had been struck across her head during the interview in which she incriminated herself. A court d'assise verdict of guilty is not a definitive conviction. What is in effect a new trial, Court d'Assise Dapolo, reviews the case. The appeal, or second grade, trial began November 2010 and was presided over by judges Claudio Pratolo Hellman and Massimo Zanetti. A court-ordered review of the contested DNA evidence by independent experts noted numerous basic errors in the gathering and analysis of the evidence, and concluded that no evidential trace of Kirch's DNA had been found on the alleged murder weapon, which police had found in Solicito's kitchen. The review found the forensic police examination showed evidence of multiple males' DNA fragments on the bra clasp, which had been lost on the floor for 47 days, the court-appointed expert testified the context strongly suggested contamination. On October 3, 2011, Knox and Solicito were found not guilty of the murder. In an official statement giving the grounds for the acquittals, Hellman said Knox had been confused by interviews of obsessive duration in a language she was still learning, and forensic evidence did not support the idea that Knox and Solicito had been present at the murder. It was emphasized that Knox's first calls raised the alarm and brought the police to the house, which made the prosecution's assertion that she had been trying to delay discovery of the body untenable. Her and Solicito's accounts failing to completely match did not constitute evidence they had given a false alibi. Knox wrote a letter to Corrado Maria Daclon, Secretary General of the Italy USA Foundation, the day after regaining her freedom, the letter read. To hold my hand and offer support and respect throughout the obstacles and the controversy, there were Italians, there was the Italy USA Foundation, and many others that shared my pain and that helped me survive, with hope. I am eternally grateful for their caring hospitality and the courageous commitment. To those that wrote to me, that defended me, that stood by me, and that prayed for me, I am forever grateful to you. On March 26, 2013, Italy's highest court, the Supreme Court of Cassation set aside the acquittals of the Hellman second trial. Retrial was ordered. Knox was represented, but remained in the United States. Judge Nensini presided at the retrial, and granted a prosecution request for analysis of previously unexamined DNA sample found on a kitchen knife of Solicitos, which the prosecution alleged was the murder weapon based on the forensic police reporting that Kirch's DNA was on it. That conclusion was discredited by court-appointed experts at the appeal trial. When the unexamined sample was tested, no DNA belonging to Kircher was found. On January 30, 2014, Knox and Solicito were found guilty. In their written explanation the judges emphasized Guade's fast-track verdict report was a judicial reference point establishing that he had not acted alone. The Nensini verdict report said there must have been a cleanup to remove traces of Knox from the house while leaving Guade's. The report said that there had been no burglary and the signs of one were staged. 
it did not consider the possibility of Guades having been responsible for faking a break-in. On March 27, 2015, the ultimate appeal by Knox and Solicito was heard by the Supreme Court of Cassation. It ruled that the case was without foundation, thereby definitively acquitting them of the murder. Her defamation conviction was upheld but the three-year sentence was deemed served by the time she had already spent in prison. On January 24, 2019, the European Court of Human Rights ordered Italy to pay compensation to Knox for violating her rights in the hours after her arrest in Perugia. Italy was ordered to pay Knox 18,400 euros, about 20,800 United States dollars, for not providing her with either a lawyer or a competent interpreter when she was first held in custody. After returning to the United States, Knox completed her degree and worked on a book about her case. She was often followed by paparazzi. Her family incurred large debts from the years of supporting her in Italy and were left insolvent, the proceeds from waiting to be heard a memoir, were used to pay legal fees to her Italian lawyers. In a 2017 interview, Knox said she was devoting herself to writing and activism for the wrongfully accused. Knox has been a reviewer and journalist for the then West Seattle Herald. Knox also hosts a podcast, The Truth About True Crime. She has been a featured speaker at fundraising events for non-profits, including the Innocence Project. In June 2019, Knox returned to Italy as a keynote speaker at a conference on criminal justice, where she was part of a panel titled Trial by Media. Knox is married to longtime boyfriend, author Christopher Robinson who is connected to the Robinson newspapers. Thanks for watching. For more videos please click like and subscribe.